you've gone quiet, which means you're ready for to hear what I've got to say. It's great to see you. It's, uh, it's Christmas time, so it's time for a bit of chemistry. This is the first Christmas lecture to be sponsored and put on by the Learned Society of Wales, and the South Wales Institute of Engineers Educational Trust. Now, the Learned Society of Wales is the National Academy for Sciences and the Arts and Humanities of Wales. And hopefully one of these days, many of you will become fellows of that society. It's particularly important to remember in these days of the creative industries, you've all heard about the creative industries. Well, today we're going to see some real creation of the chemists. And remember this. Chemists and engineers make things that people need. I'm not so sure you'll carry anything away from you today that you will need, but I hope you'll carry away a great experience because Peter Douglas, Dr. Peter Douglas from Swansea, assisted by Dr. Mike Carley, they are experts in this business of projecting chemistry through the medium of light. They are a famous pair. The last time they gave this lecture was in Durban, in South Africa. And here they are, hot-footed back, in order to talk to you today. The title of the lecture, Chemistry in Light. Enlighten us. Take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. I'm Peter Douglas, and this is Mike Gawley sitting there in charge of all the AV stuff. I'm going to do all the talking. Um, so first of all, uh, a couple of thank yous. First of all, thank you to the Learned Society of Wales for giving me and Mike a chance to come here and tell you a bit about some science that we think is dead interesting and lots of fun. Uh, and then I also want to thank the School of Chemistry in Cardiff for letting me use the Super Lecture Theatre uh, to give the, the lecture in. The lecture is going to be uh, about light and chemistry, how light and chemistry interact. But before we start the lecture, and something you should do in any public place, we need to talk a little bit about safety. So the first thing, when you go into any public place, is you should find out where the safety exit is. And the safety exit in this lecture theatre is in that corner, so I want you to make sure you know where it is. We've never had anything go wrong in a lecture, but the fire alarm might just go off in the building. If the fire alarm goes off in the building, or if anything happens in the lecture, Mike Gawley will lead you out through there, goes down a concrete stairwell, and then outside. And I'll stay here to make sure everybody's out, like the captain of the ship. So that's the safety bit done. The lecture's going to be uh, split in two halves. The first bit is going to be in the dark, to allow the demonstrations to be seen to best advantage. And in that part of the lecture, we'll talk about generating light, We'll talk about our light sources that we use, tungsten bulbs, fluorescent tubes. And then in the second, and we'll also talk about how we use light in entertainment. Then in the second half of the lecture, we'll talk about how we use light in technology, primarily. And we'll be leading to the idea that light offers solutions to two of the great problems facing mankind. The two great problems facing mankind, scientific problems, are clean energy, and clean water. So we'll look at them at the end of uh, the lecture. So I think we'll start with some slides. I'll knock the lights out. When it goes dark, I'm going to try and make sure I don't trip up there over anything. And we'll see how much light we'll get in the lecture theater. Okay, so if we are going to do some photochemistry, some chemistry and light, we need a light source. And our natural light source is the sun. This enormous nuclear reactor, 93 million miles away, generating an enormous amount of energy. Inside the sun is a series of nuclear reactions. The energy is released. It migrates to the surface of the sun, where it makes the surface of the sun about five and a half thousand degrees centigrade, and then it glows brilliant white. Next slide, please, Mike. Now, I mentioned safety at the start. The safety officer said we couldn't do this demonstration because that's what happens inside the sun. That's a hydrogen bomb going off. And when you have an enormous amount of energy 
you get light generated. And one of the themes that's going to run through the lecture is interconversions of energy. Light energy, chemical energy, electrical energy, mechanical energy, those interconversions. Next slide, please, Mike. Now, the problem with the sun is that it has this habit of going away at the night. So at night, we need to generate artificial light. This is a skyline you will not see anymore. It's twin towers. But what you see is mankind's enormous need for light in the night. Next one, Mike, please. And the first demonstration is going to be about one of the most common light sources, a tungsten bulb. And in a tungsten bulb, we have a filament of a, of a, a metal. The original bulbs like this were actually had a carbon filament. But they use tungsten because it, uh, it's got a very high... Uh, melting point and vaporization point. So it's a hot body made white hot by electrical energy being converted into heat energy in the bulb, in the, in the filament, and then it generates light. So what I'm going to do is project the spectrum of a tungsten bulb. So inside this projector is a tungsten bulb, and on the left hand side, well, yeah, your left hand side of the lecture theatre, we've got the spectrum from a tungsten bulb. And what you see is very similar to the sun. It's a continuum. It goes right the way through from red through to blue, through to ultraviolet as well, and infrared as well. So we've got a continuous spectrum from a tungsten bulb. Next to the projector is a white light source, which is a little bit different. And we'll see why that's different in a minute. But it still looks white to you, but it's a very different type of spectrum. So tungsten bulb, electrical energy, thermal energy, light energy. Now you might, now we don't have to use electrical energy to get the thermal energy, we can use chemical energy and we can burn something. So we're going to burn a strip of magnesium ribbon. It's going to be very bright, I don't want you to stare at it, there'll be enough light to light up the lecture theatre. So if we ignite this piece of magnesium ribbon. So this is a chemical reaction, the oxidation of the magnesium leaves a magnesium oxide behind, which is made white hot by the energy of the reaction. Now you might think that if we put anything in a flame and make it hot, we're therefore going to get white light. But in fact we know, certainly as chemists, that if we put different salts into a flame, we get different colours. So if I put some copper into a flame, I get a green. You'll see these in fireworks. And nowadays people use a lot of fireworks at New Year, so it's the right time of year to be showing you them. So we get this lovely green from copper. Every time copper atoms get put in a flame, we get that green colour. And if we put sodium in a flame, we get this lovely orange yellow, which you'll see. If any of you have a gas cooker, you just sprinkle a little bit of salt in the gas flames, you'll see that. You'll see this as sodium street lamps. So you'll see this colour a lot that tells you sodium is present. And then the last one I'll show you here is strontium, which gives this beautiful crimson colour. So these salts, these atoms, are giving us a particular colour. But if we heat the hot body, the solid body up, we get a continuum. Now why does that happen? To understand that, we need to have a model of the atom. So I'm going to knock this off. And this is our model of the atom. So what we've got, what we've got is an inner core of the nucleus, and then around it, outside are the electrons. The electrons don't move around, sorry, the electrons are two different colours, but we're going to separate them out so we can see what happens to one of them. And the electrons are in orbitals around the central nucleus. That's an atom in its ordinary state, its ground state we would call it. We're going to put some energy in. What happens? The electron jumps away from the nucleus. It's further away from a positive charge, so it's higher in energy. And then eventually, it's got to get rid of its energy, and it does that in a pulse of light. So there's the, the thermal energy exciting it, and then the pulse of light. Now, the wavelength the energy of that pulse of light is determined by the energy difference of this outer orbital and the energy of the inner orbital. That energy difference is controlled by the charge on the nucleus. And that means 
that every element has a distinct emission spectrum. So that's how you can use this, these ideas in analytical science. So this is excitation of atoms now. And we use excitation of atoms in the fluorescent bulb and in this white light. Because this white light now that I'm projecting is a mixture of mercury, zinc and cadmium and on the, your left hand side you will see the colours, pretty much the colours of the rainbow but not as a continuum. We've got red, orange, green, goes right the way through the blues. But now these are discrete lines. And these are discrete lines because they match the energy gaps of the electrons jumping in those atoms. So that's a white light made up of a series of lines. That's a line spectrum. So that is electrical energy into a gas. And the gas is converting that electrical energy into light. Now we use that in our technology because that's what happens inside a fluorescent tube. So if I get a fluorescent tube in my right hand, and I've got a high voltage source in my left hand. So if here's a fluorescent tube, and I'm going to apply high voltage to it. So you see the fluorescent tube light up, the electrical field is generating excited atoms, it's mercury that's inside the fluorescent tube, and what you will notice is that the light stops where my hand is. So if I move my hand a little bit further down, I get a longer beam of light. And you'll see the arc of the Tesla coil on the tube. Now when you look at the fluorescent tube, it's white on the end. It looks white. And it's white because on the inside of the glass, there is a phosphor that converts those line emissions into white light that's suitable for your eyes. Wherever you get some good technology, you often get some nice toys. So let's introduce plasma glue ball. So this is the same sort of principle, but now we have neon gas in there to give this lovely pink colour. And if I can do this, there's not a lot of room in here, if I can do this properly, there's enough electric field around that to light up the fluorescent tube. Whoever's taking pictures, I've got a feeling if you're using a flash or anything, they're not going to come out the way you want them to be, so you're best off not really. Right, so here, plasma glow ball meets fluorescent tube. Now this plasma glow ball, this light's leaked out. I'm going to pour it all back. And I'm going to pour it all back by sliding my hand down and getting it back into the box, into the tube. Right, so that's plasma glow ball meets the fluorescent tube. This is electricity, this is light from electricity through a gas. And we use that, scientists use that in one of their most common lasers, a helium neon laser. And this is the beam from a helium neon laser. So now we're controlling, we're controlling the way the light is emitted to give a very monochromatic light beam which is, doesn't diverge, it doesn't spread out. Lasers were inv invented in 1960, the first practical laser. People described it as a solution looking for problems because they didn't know what to do with it. Nowadays, we use them all over. We use them in CD readers. We use them in barcode readers and supermarkets. We use them in military for ranging and targeting. We use them for something as simple as a pen pointer. So if I can get a hold of these different pen pointers that I have, we have A green pen pointer. So this, this now is light from a solid. So now electricity from the batteries goes into a solid to generate this lovely green light. The red one's dead, but this one here is a blue. And one of the things that lasers do is act as a concentrated beam of energy. So they're used in surgery as well. And in surgery, they cut and they cauterize at the same time. So one experiment, this is the first time we've done this, I want to see if I can use the light 
from this blue laser to burst the balloon. Right? So to illustrate the energy of a laser beam, let's just see. I think I'd have brought a pin where it's to make sure I would work, wouldn't you? <laughs> it certainly did yesterday. Well, there you go. One of the things you can use lasers for is laser surgery, where it puts and cauterizes. One of the things this one's not going to work for is bursting the balloon. I'm sorry about that one. So lasers give us this brilliant beam of light, dead important in science and technology. That's light through a solid. We can also pass light through a flexible solid. So here, we have, instead of uh, the light coming out as a, as a beam, we have it on a flat screen. So this is a semiconductor material with electricity in. The electrons in the semiconductor material get excited, they emit light. So we have a blue one, somewhere in here we should have the we'll stick with a blue one. But you're not restricted to having this as a flat screen, you can have them as cables. So this one should be the blue cable for the girls, and this one should be the pink cable for the boys. And we should be able to change the way these move. The right button. So we can have them flashing. So these, again, the semiconductor material, light being, electrical energy being passed through, converted into light, and emitted. So that's a way to get noticed on your bike or whatever. Talk about how to get noticed in the nightclub later on, so you might want to remember some of them for that purpose. So those are all the generation, apart from the burning the magnesium ribbon. Burning the magnesium ribbon gave us light from chemical energy. But it also made the magnesium oxide hot, that's how it worked. But you can get light from chemical reactions directly. It's chemiluminescence, we know you can do it. Fireflies do it, deep sea fish do it. They send messages to each other by flashing bioluminescent light. So mushrooms do it. Not that they're sending messages to each other, but they just glow. Right, so now I'm going to try and generate some liquid light. It's a chemiluminescent reaction between luminol and hydrogen peroxide. Good, I'm pleased you like that one. So that's, I like this one so much, I do it three times. So that's just the reaction as it is, and now I'm going to do the reaction with some dyes added. This one, anybody seen the film Predator? Yeah, it's a little film now, but that's Predator blood. Remember when a Predator gets damaged? It's a green blood. And this one's for the milkshake freeze. Same reaction, different dyes. So we get these different colours. Now the thing about this is that we are getting light without heat. So that means we are not generating a source of ignition. It means that we can generate the light when it's impossible to ignite something. So say for example in a mine or when you're at sea. And it's not surprising to find that these chemicals can be bought as sticks. So you get them as light sticks. And they use as light sticks as emergency light. So we'll have a light stick. The two chemicals separated by a glass vial. One of them's in a glass vial, one of them's in the plastic surrounding. Snap it, mix them, you've got a light to get the helicopter down to rescue you. You've got light in a situation where all the electrical lights have gone out. Now, what are you going to do with this? It's a nice bit of uh, nice glowing material, so after you've played with it for a little bit, there's a few things you can do with it. One of them 
is to get the opportunity to go to a nuclear reactor site, <laughs> like Windscale, or whatever it's called nowadays. I keep changing the names of them, so I don't know if it's called Windscale anymore. So you go on the tour of the, uh, the, the nuclear site, and at the end of it, you come into the central control panel, and you've been impressed with how safe everything is and how it all works. And then somebody says, have you got any questions? And you say, well, I found one of these in a pond outside. <laughs> right. You will be out of that room in a flash. <laughs> and I apologies to any physicists in the room, of course, because radiation doesn't glow like this. We see it, we think of this, because originally, when they found radium, they used it to act as an energy source for zinc sulfide phosphors, and they do glow green. So we associated that colour with radiation. And you see, if you watch The Simpsons, you see Homer Simpson come home, he's been at his nuclear site, hasn't he? He's been at work in a nuclear factory, and he's got one of these stuck in the back of his neck. So that's what happens to me as well. So we'll get rid of this. It's going to be, I've got to put it somewhere where it's not going to get in the way of the lecture. Now you get those, you get those uh, chemiluminescent light sticks also as night jewellery. So why, I say, should lasses have all the fun lads? Why not have the lads wearing some night jewellery as well? So you get it as necklaces. Now these will last, it's a chemical reaction, so it's not going to last forever. They'll last for a few hours. Make uh, people notice you in the night. I've got a variety of different colours. So I'll just get myself a couple of necklaces on. Do one, I hope. Yeah, do one, I like. <coughs> Same reactions. Now it's not actually luminol and hydrogen peroxide, it's a different mixture, and these really efficient chemiluminescent materials, the light sticks, were invented by the American military in response to the problems that their troops had in Vietnam. Because they found that the Viet Cong could move through the night very easily, and the Americans who had torches had difficulty because the batteries corroded, and batteries are really heavy for how much energy they've got in them. And they discovered that the Viet Cong moved through the night because they had glow worms in jam jars. And then they got the American chemical industry to make these light sticks. Now you get them in lots of different forms. Some of them I really like. I like this one. This is a, this is a pendant drop. It's made for somebody whose head's not as big as mine, so it just sits on my face like that. All I can see is a bright blue thing in front of my eyes at the minute. But the ones that I really like are the earrings. I'm going to crack a few earrings because I'm going to tell you a little bit about earring, what, wearing earrings and the messages that you send when you wear different earrings. I'm going to crack a few because I need a few. So first of all, first of all, I've got to figure out how to put them on. Let's see if I can get this one on. So, there we are. That's on. So one earring, what are you saying? What's the message you're sending? One earring, pirate. <laughs> Next one. Two earrings. Well, you're looking a little bit as he, as he is on, aren't you? You're looking a little bit transvestite now. Two earrings. <laughs> Three earrings. The one of them up your nose. You're a punk, aren't you? So you've got to be careful when you wear earrings to make sure that the message that you're sending is the message that you want to send. So earrings, necklaces, pendant drops, all those sort of things, night jewellery. We'll come back to that later on perhaps when we talk about getting noticed in the club. <laughs> right, 
So that's the generation of light from a chemical reaction. We can also generate light from light. Now that might sound a little bit odd, but the electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum runs right the way across into the ultraviolet, which we can't see, but which is a source of energy. Other animals can see it. Uh, bees, insects can see some ultraviolet. But you can get dye stuffs which will absorb ultraviolet light, take up that energy, and then re-emit it as visible light, because they lose some energy. So, I've got two big ultraviolet lamps here. 366 nanometer wavelengths, so the safe ultraviolet. In here is some ethanol, and I'm going to add some dyes to the ethanol. And when I do that, they will absorb the light, then they will lose some energy, and then they will re-emit a little bit less energy as light, and therefore it will be visible. So all of these different colour dyes all dissolve at different rates and fall at different rates. So you build up all these different colours. And this is fluorescence. So we convert an ultraviolet light into visible light. And slowly, this will generate enough light to illuminate the lecture theatre. It also shows how much light's coming from these ultraviolet lamps that you're not able to see. So that's fluorescence. And we use fluorescence a lot. We use fluorescence in lots of things. So we use it in... Get rid of this first. We use it in safety. We use it in safety fluids. So you will see people working, <coughs> working on the railways, working on the, on the roads, and they'll wear a, a fluorescent vest. So all of the light that comes in gets converted into essentially one colour. So they look really brilliant. You can get fluorescent materials just in sheets of plastic. So he has a series of sheets of plastic. You see fluorescent rulers, fluorescent cocktail uh, stirrers. It's just because it's pretty for the most part. But you can see the amount of light. The green one really shows how much energy is coming out from these bulbs. Your eyes very sensitive to green light when you're in the dark. And here's a blue one as well. So fluorescent materials. I'm going to introduce you to a particular fluorescent chemical because I want to talk about chemistry and medicine just for a little bit. So we know if something is glowing, it's got a lot of energy in it. So this solution here is a solution of a porphyrin, a particular type of compound which has this beautiful cherry red luminescence. So you know that that porphyrin, when you shine light on it, is excited. It's got electrons that are high energy electrons. So it's an excited molecule. And porphyrins are used in the fight against cancer because these excited molecules transfer their energy to oxygen. Oxygen becomes excited, and when oxygen's in excited state, single oxygen, it destroys everything around it. And the really super thing about these porphyrins is that they stick to tumors. So for the dynamic therapy, you get some of these porphyrins, you either, if it's a tumor on the outside, you might paint it on, if it's on the inside, you might ingest it, <coughs> then you irradiate it, perhaps using uh, a laser, or if it's on the outside, a big lamp. The porphyrin absorbs <coughs> the energy. It transfers the energy to oxygen, oxygen gets excited and destroys the tumour. So that's a chemist's contribution, a photochemist's contribution to the fight against cancer. Now, when we use lasers for this sort of thing, we use fiber optics to guide them. And here's a little demonstration of fiber optics. Because in a fiber optic, it allows you to control the way the light moves. Here, we have an ordinary tungsten bulb underneath with some different colors. And the light is collected in these nylon fibers, and it's emitted on the outside, at the edge, sorry. It doesn't get through off the sides because of total internal reflection. And we use fiber optics to control light. We use it now for the transmission of information. So, nowadays, fiber optic cables carry information rather than copper cables. Probably in your lifetime, 
laptops and computers will not be laptops, will there will be something I can't even think of what they'll have in the end, but they will have fibre optic materials in them. So we use lasers through fibre optics to direct them. So this is a porphyrin, that's fluorescence. We also use fluorescence every day when we do our washing, nearly every day anyway. This is a tube of washing powders which looks white in daylight. But some of the washing powders have what's called an optical brightener in them and some of them don't. So when we look at them under ultraviolet light, they look alternating blue-white and mud. So these ones which look grey, mud, these don't have an optical brightener in them. These ones which look this brilliant blue have optical brightener in them. These ones are the ecologically friendly ones, ecova, that sort of thing. So I thought we'd have a look at the audience to find out who's been getting washed recently and in what sort of washing powder, at least their clothes. So I'll do that now and we'll come back to it. So I'm going to put these ultraviolet lights on you. That, as I said, the 366 light, you'll get more UV light in 15 minutes outside than you'll get off these, probably less than 15 minutes even. So, I'm going to shine this on the audience for a little bit. We'll see what, what materials you have grow. But before I do this, before I do this, I'll just tell you a couple of things. Um, dandruff fluorescence. <laughs> and your teeth will fluoresce lovely. Right? So, I'm going to shine them on. There we are. Some brilliant blues. Let's have some smiles. Some brilliant lights. White blouse is really glowing, brilliant blue. You're using photochemistry all the time. You're making your washing look whiter than white by using an optical brightener that absorbs ultraviolet that your eyes can't see very well and converts it into blue light. So your washing looks whiter than white. What else do we use fluorescence for? We use fluorescence in security marking. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about security marking. I'm going to talk to you about something that might help you in our present economic problems. You know that when the uh, banking crisis happens, happened, one of the things the Bank of England did was print some more money. So I'm going to talk to you about do-it-yourself quantitative easing, it was called. Do-it-yourself quantitative easing also is known by the name of forgery. So I'm going to talk to you about forgery. So I'm going to show you some, if I can find them, some notes. What's the problem when you try to forge money? The problem when you try to forge money is that paper also has optical brightening on it. This is an ordinary sheet of white paper. You see how much light's coming into the lecture theatre now from this. Now, when you go to the bank, one of the first things a teller will do in the bank to check the money is put it under an ultraviolet lamp. And if it glows like that, they know it's made on ordinary paper. There is no problem in copying, printing out notes that will pass the bartender of an evening, for example. We have excellent scanners, we have excellent printers. But the paper is a little bit of a problem because if I now put on this block of paper, a UK £10 note, it's black. And it's black because it doesn't have optical brightener in it. Right? So, 
Your problem is how to make your paper look like that. And some enterprising people from the northeast of England, where I'm from, some enterprising young men, decided, discovered the material that was available freely to everybody, that was designed specifically to stop ultraviolet light, and the material was available cheaply. You just dip down to the chemist because it's sunblock. Right? So if you wash paper in sunblock, it stops being fluorescent because the sunblock absorbs the ultraviolet light before it hits the optical brightener. So these lads in the northeast washed all their paper and sunblock and forged all the money. And everybody was very happy up there because they were all millionaires. The money smelled of coconut oil, but nobody cared about that. <laughs> but they committed a really big mistake at the end of it because they boasted about it to a friend in the pub and he grasped them. So, what are you going to do if you're going to do some forgery? Well, first of all, you're going to have to get some sunblock. You're going to have to wash your paper and sunblock. You're then going to have to choose your currency. Because some currencies solve this problem by making their currency really lovely under ultraviolet light. So this sheet of paper has three euro, five euro notes. You see that beautiful yellow lemon luminescence? And then on the other side, we have some lovely red stars and again a lovely lemon block. This yellow block, lemon yellow block, is blue under daylight. So the teller can immediately tell if you've got euros. So you don't want to be forging euros, you want to be forging UK 10 pound or 20 pound notes. Right? If any of you are successful, all I ask is that you remember who told you how to do it. <laughs> but I don't want any of the forged ones, because I'll be able to tell. I want the proper ones. So that's fluorescence. But there is another emission that we see often from light, from things that have been exposed to light, and that's phosphorescence. And we use phosphorescence because it's a long-lived emission. So this is a phosphorescent sign. It's a safety sign. And what happens in phosphorescence is that the energy that goes in from the light gets trapped in the matrix of the phosphorescent material and then it slowly leaks out. In fluorescence, if we put something fluorescent in a beam of light and take a beam of light away, it dies almost instantaneously within a thousandth millionth of a second. But phosphorescent lives for a long, phosphorescence lives for a long time. So we use phosphorescence for safety signs, so when the lights have gone off, the safety signs still stay on. And we use phosphorescence so for emergencies. And nowadays, you can buy phosphorescent material which is suitable for little personal emergencies that you might have. Because you can get phosphorescent toilet roll. got some phosphorescent. <laughs> You're stuck in the house and the lights have gone out. Ah! What am I going to do? No problem, you found it. My favourites, my favourite phosphorescent materials that I've got are these gloves. These gloves have been impregnated with a phosphorescent material. And when I get them on, They'll glow in the dark. So I've got some hands there. <laughs> These gloves, when you buy them, the splurge, the bit of pattern that goes with them, says they're used for signing, for sign language in the dark. So I might sell some to the South Africans. <laughs> to help improve their sign language. It's not like being topical, is it? So, that's phosphorescence. Okay, so, 
What else do we use ultraviolet light for? What else do we use fluorescence for? A little bit of phosphorescence. We use it in entertainment. We use it in discos and in clubs to give a sense of, of the unusual. Because the lighting's different in a disco and a club. So what I'm going to do now is talk to you a little bit about how to get noticed. That's what you want to do. You're going to go to the, the school Christmas bash. They might have UV lights on. You want people to notice you. You want people to remember you. So let's have a look at some of the things that you ought to take along with you. Well, first of all, you ought to take along lots of money. I've just shifted where my money is. But you want to take along lots of money, preferably money that's blue and good and they don't have lights. So you've got lots of euros. People are always like you if you've got lots of money. So you've turned up in the club, you've got lots of money. You want some things to talk about when you're at the bar or whatever, depending on what age you are, of course. So you want to take some fluorescent rocks along. So here's a bit of fluorite. Right, so now people, hey, somebody coming, he's got loads of money, and he's got a bit of fluorite. <laughs> a lovely piece of calcite. This calcite is beautiful. Now, the colour comes from impurities in the crystals, rare earth impurities. So, fluorite, calcite. Now, they're really quite nice, but if you want to make a mark in the world, you usually have to do something really quite spectacular. So, what you want is not one of them little useless bits of rock. You want a proper big <laughs> bit of rock. <laughs> So if you can get that past the bouncers, I'd be dead impressed. <laughs> I'm going to show me friends. I'm going to show me friends. You're not getting in with that, mate. Right, so you've got a giant loop of rock. You've got some money. You've got some little bits of rock. What else do you want to take? You want to take in some jewels. You want to take in some rubies. Because rubies glow beautifully under ultraviolet light. So that, see the red emission? That's a handful of rubies. And that red light that you can see was the very first laser light anybody ever saw, because it's the emission from rubies that we use. So you've got a handful of rubies, you've got loads of money, you've got some rocks, perhaps the conversation's faltered a little bit, so perhaps you want to start talking to people about your, your little fossil fish that you've brought along, just to show them. <laughs> see your little fossil fish? That fossil fish is grown for the same reason that your teeth do. It's got appetite in it. So you've got your fossil fish. People are starting to think not only are you rich, but you're a little bit peculiar. <laughs> and you want to take in a plant. <laughs> because it's got to be a particular plant. This spider plant. See that red emission from the spider plant? Can you see the red light? Yeah? That red light is the light that a plant cannot use for, for, for photosynthesis. And it's re emitting it as fluorescence, right? So you're in the club, you've got your money, you've got your rocks, you've got your fossil fish, you've got your plant, and then you've got to decide really what, what you're going to wear. So, you, and in the olden days, when I first started this lecture, I might have said, well, you want to wash your clothes in something that's got a little brightener in it. You want to wash it in something like Omo or Dance or something like that. So that you're going to glow really bright white. Dandruff? Optional. Um, <laughs> and then you're probably going to say, well, teeth, all right, so alternating teeth, get them knocked out or painted black so you look like a piano keyboard when you smile. People will remember that, <laughs> won't they? But what you really ought to wear is the costume. The suit that the good Lord gives you. <laughs> <laughs> so you're in a club. This club. Yep. Yeah. This little fella depends on how much Christmas puddies I'd read. <laughs> and then it's noisy where they have UV lights very often, you know, in a, in a club or a school disco or whatever like that. So you want a message. 
went to go and I said, so this is fancy a paint. No, it doesn't say fancy a painting. That's for a different audience. It says fancy a dance pet. Because pet is a term of endearment in the Northeast. So you're waving your arms, you put your gear on, fancy a dance pet. And then you've got to get the right gear. You've got to put the right shots to get the right gear. This is one of my favourites. Go to a shot that's got a choker. This is made, these are all made for people who are littler than me. Because they strangled me when I put this on. But we'll get this choker on. Do you want the choker on? What else do you want to do? Oh, well, you almost certainly want an ERA or a pendant drop or something like that. But we'll concentrate on the clues for the minute. What else are you going to take? Well, you wouldn't go out without a bit of lippy on, would you? Have some luminescent lippy, and of course, you'd want your nails to look good as well, wouldn't you? So, I want some luminescent nail varnish. There you go. My nails are dry, I'm afraid. So, I've got my nails, got my lippy on, bit of. Uh, Real cream, which I think I'll put in what's left of me whiskers at the front. A little bit of real cream. Mm. Real cream there. So you got that. You got that. You're looking good. You're looking good in the club now. And then let's see what else we got. I really enjoy, it's not often my wife lets me dress up like this, so <laughs> for me this is a real treat this is, so it's off you. Fishnet gloves. Fishnet gloves, yeah, we've got them on. And I hate anybody. I hate anybody to think I wasn't anywhere sexist. <laughs> so all the gloves. So you're getting noticed, aren't you? If nothing else, people remember who you are. And then we've got some other chemiluminescent things here. Let's see if I can get these to work. I don't know if they will. When you buy stuff, you think it's, you, all right, this is going to be insects, right? It's supposed to be bunny ears, but they're not wrapping around the way they should. So I think we're going to go for insects, we'll see. I think that one will hand. No, that one hand. <laughs> right, they are going to be insects. <laughs> of some sort. I don't know what sort of insect looks like this, but that's insect. Like that. <laughs> right, so we've got them on as well. <laughs> And then you need a nice whoa. And then when you've got all your stuff on, you want to be drinking the right drink. You've got your stuff on and you want to be drinking the right drink. Any offers for what the right drink the drink is if you want to look noticeable? Gin and tonic. Gin and tonic. Well, for this audience, probably just tonic. But for some members of the audience, gin and tonic. But yes, tonic's got quinine in it, and quinine fluoresces a beautiful blue. So there's your... <laughs> and nowadays, you'll buy a shot glass, tell me luminous and shot glass, to have your tonic in. So there you are, you've had a great night at the club. <laughs> Everybody knows who you are. <laughs> but you go back to the lockers and you find somebody's stolen all your clothes. And you've only got enough money for the bus fare back. 
so I'm going to show you what you look like standing at the bus stop. Because I've got a <laughs> That's what I do at the weekend. <laughs> but then, I have to go back to work. <laughs> Told you chemistry and life was fun, didn't I? <laughs> So in the week, of course, I've got to be more serious. So now we're going to talk about light and technology. Um, and I'm going to start with perhaps the most, well, actually, I'm going to start with something that needs to be left for a little while. As I said, the two great problems facing mankind, certainly that chemists can make a major contribution to, clean energy, clean water. So I'm going to start with clean water. Ultraviolet light has a lot of energy in it. It has enough energy in it to break chemical bonds, destroy large chemical structures, break them down into small chemical structures. But you need something to absorb that ultraviolet light to do it. And the material that does it really well is titanium dioxide. Titanium dioxide is a white material. It's used, all this paint here is titanium dioxide paint. Uh, chicken roll has got titanium dioxide in it to make it white. Global mints have got titanium dioxide in it. When it's used like that, the titanium dioxide particles are coated with silica. Because if you have raw titanium dioxide, when it absorbs ultraviolet light, it becomes so reactive on the surface, by reacting with the water around it, that it will destroy every organic that's ever been tried with it. It will break it down, it might take a while, but it will break it down from a complex organic into carbon dioxide and water, ammonia, HCl, if it's uh, uh, chlorinated. So I'm going to try and illustrate that for you now. This is a black one. This is the one that I'm going to use. So these have got titanium dioxide powder in them as a uh, colloidal suspension. I'm going to contaminate one of them. I'm going to put some methylene blue in. I've put too much in, so it's going to take a while. It might not get completely cooked. I don't think I put a lot in that one. Right, so this now is polluted. Now we pollute our water with everything that comes out of our houses. So all of the pharmaceuticals go into it, um, all of the pesticides from the farms go into the water, and it has to be taken out, it has to be stripped out somewhere or another. that. One way to do it is ultraviolet light and titanium dioxide. So I'm going to put this now in a bank of ultraviolet lamps, and we'll come back to that at the end of the lecture to see if it's done. The use uh, titanium dioxide, it also destroys uh, bacteria and viruses. Right, so that's probably, uh, well that's the one I have to start with. Now I'm going to move on to the one that might be the most common or the most obvious to you. Certainly people in my generation it probably was because we didn't use digital photography as much as you, we used conventional silver halide photography. So I'm going to demonstrate the very first process for making a Photographic image by positive and negative processes. It was a, a system invented by Fox Talbot about 1840, I think, certainly in the mid-80s, and it relies on the light sensitivity of silver halide. Now, you probably know that um, silver salts are light sensitive. I should have started this one earlier as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a sheet of paper and I'm going to impregnate it with silver chloride. So I'm going to start it off by putting the paper in sodium chloride solution, common salt. And we let the common salt soak into the paper. When it soaks into the paper, I'm going to put it into silver nitrate. This should have been soaked for a little bit longer, but I think we'll just run with it to save time in the lecture. So the sodium chloride is impregnating the paper. We take it out and then we need to blot it dry to get rid of the excess to make sure we get a nice image. Nearly not the next demonstration over. So this now is a piece of paper which has got sodium chloride in it and now if I put it in silver nitrate solution what will happen, you'll, most of you will know that the silver chloride is insoluble 
it will be precipitated into the paper as an off-white material. I'm not sure how this is going to go. I'm going to put another piece of paper in just in case this one doesn't work out very happy. Just so it's got a lot of salt in it. Now people have known about the light sensitivity of silver salts for a long time. The problem isn't making the light sensitive paper, the problem is keeping it afterwards. And it was Fox Talbot who developed a process for that and that's how he could use it practically. Because of course if it's light sensitive, every time you show it to somebody, it's going to get darker and darker and darker. But he found by accident, one of those super accidents in science, that if you washed it in excess salt, the image was preserved because it washed the excess salt washed away the silver right so it looks grey at least so I'm a little bit optimistic so now I've got a piece of paper which I hope is light sensitive I'm going to put it on a, a frame on a, on a glass sheet and then I need something to make an image of so I'm going to make an image of a fern so this fern is going to go on top of my piece of paper and then I'm going to put another piece of glass on top to keep it flat so that's the thing I want to make an image of I've got a piece of light sensitive paper I hope I've got something that's going to block the light and I'm going to shine light on it it takes a lot of light to do this because it doesn't have the amplification steps that you have in uh, ordinary photography so black and white photography when you look at a black and white print if it's a proper black and white silver here I print the black is metallic silver when you look at the negative the black in the negative is metallic silver it's not all made photochemically what happens is in the camera when the shutter goes is opened and the light hits the film you get a latent image which then is developed by chemical processes now this method this paper has got sulfur in the surface of it so we will get a chocolate brown silver sulfide which is really quite pretty I think so you can see it's gone chocolate brown where the light hit it and then if I take the print off I've got this really nice image of a fern and you can make really lovely images like this but if you do do it and it's really good fun doing it silver salts are very toxic and they will make everything black right so you have to wear gloves and all clothes but that's a way of making a print and what Fox Talbot did then was he says right now we can make a positive see this is a negative because where the plant was it's white where the plant wasn't this is chocolate brown so now what we do is we take this we put that sheet on top of a piece of paper we shine light through it and where the light goes through the white bit it will go dark and where the light is stopped here it will stay white so then we get a positive image that was the very first photographic process using positive negatives right what else does light do so the light can make and destroy plastics can make polymers and destroy polymers so first of all we'll just try making a polymer sometimes this one works sometimes it doesn't i'm just reminded of my balloons which are still there um, so we're going to make a plastic hopefully to make a polymer the polymer is a long molecule all monomers zipped up together right so we have to start with monomers and then we zip them together with some energy. This is a liquid monomer. And we want to zip these up to make a polymer. And to do that, we need some energy. Once we start the zipping up process, there's enough energy released for it to continue. So I'm going to do it by absorbing light. And I'll put some methylene blue and ethanol in there. This is a little bit temperamental, this demonstration. So might work it might not so now I've got a blue liquid and I want to convert that into a white solid or in fact it might just end up being a white gel right but here's my dish to pour it in and now what I need to do is illuminate it with some white light and what will happen if I'm lucky is the energy the light energy will be absorbed by the methylene blue the methylene blue will become excited and it will convert it will zip up the monomer so it gives some of its energy to a monomer it might pull an electron off it I'm not exactly sure of the mechanism but if we give it a bit of UV a bit of visible light we turn that into a solid why would you do it? well you do it all the time you use it for making photocurin inks so when you make these little 
bottles of stuff that go down on a production line, the ink gets sprayed onto it, it doesn't have to sit out in the sun to dry, it's just put through a bank of UV lights. Dentists use the same thing. Anybody been to the dentist and had the, the blue light put in for an acrylate to, to seal fissures in your teeth or anything like that? It's the same sort of principle. You're making a polymer with light. Light also destroys polymers. Why would you want to destroy a polymer? Well, to think about why we might want to do that, you have to think about the electronic revolution, which was brought about by a silicon chip. And the question is, how do you make a silicon chip with all of that incredible detail on it when you can't even draw wires thin enough to do that? And you do it with light. I'll just show you the type of problem that you've got. On this mask, on this mask, are little squares. And each one of those little squares represents a chip. And each of those chips has got loads of little bits on it that need to be made. People at the front can see them, perhaps? See these tiny little... If I knock the lights down a little bit. These tiny little black patches? Those bits are what we want to have on our silicon chip. But we can't make them that small mechanically. What we do is we make an image like that, which is called a mask, foot resist mask. We put it in what's essentially an inverted microscope. We take the image, we focus it onto a silicon chip, which has got a plastic on top, which is light sensitive. Where the light hits the plastic, it dissolves off. Then the chemists can change the surface of that silicon chip by putting some other compound on it, some other metal in it. Some Indian phosphorus, I don't know what it would be, but something in there that would give you the properties that you want with the chip. So I'm going to illustrate that with a photoresist board. And a photoresist board is a sheet of copper with a, pla with a plastic on top. And I'm going to make an image of a, a camera. So there's my image of a camera. And it needs a little bit of UV light. So, I'm going to put that on top, and I'm going to shine the UV light, and we'll come back to that. Now, the plastic doesn't get destroyed immediately. We've actually got to develop it, so we'll do that in the development tank. So, some ultraviolet light on that. What else does light do? Light changes the shapes of molecules, and when molecules change shape, they change colour. And we use it in photochromism. So I'm going to introduce you to Sunny. Sunny's a doll who me and Mike have looked after for a long time. She's been with us for many years. And she's dead interesting. She's good company. And she's got photochromic hair. When we put her out in the sun, her hair gets a pink rinse. Because it's got a compound which absorbs ultraviolet light, changes its shape, becomes pink, and then eventually it goes back again. Now, Sunny's been round the block a few times, so she needs a damn good cook for this. So she goes under the ultraviolet lights. She's not so keen on this bit. Pink rinse. Now we put her in the dark. She hates that even more. And the pink rinse disappears. Because the photochromism is thermally reversible. So that's the change of molecular shape. And we use that essentially a change in molecular shape and a really important medical application of light and that's the treatment of jaundice jaundice is an illness which is characterised by the build up of bilirubin in your body bilirubin is a yellow <coughs> neurotoxic material so if you see anybody who's got jaundice they look yellow they can look like a lemon if they've got jaundice bad enough now, you're making this yellow compound, bilirubin, in your body all the time. It, it's produced by the breakdown of blood. So, you know when you get a bruise, and your bruise goes yellow? That's bilirubin. And your body deals with this neurotoxic material through your liver, and destroys it, and gets rid of it. But there's a group of uh, people who cannot do that, and that group of people are premature babies. Premature babies, when they're born, 
fit on a palm of my hand. They have bits of them that aren't working properly. Lungs might not work properly. The livers usually aren't working properly. A midwife noticed that the premature babies in her ward, the ones that were next to the window survived jaundice, and the ones that were in the dark didn't. It was as simple as that. Up until that point, there was no cure for it. And now, if you go into a, a premature baby ward, you'll see the premature babies in cots with ultraviolet light on them, with little patches on their eyes to protect their eyes. And they've been irradiated because light is curing the jaundice. Anyway, to illustrate this, here's Junior. <coughs> Junior's a big big for a premature baby. Junior's a boy. Um, he's got a really bad case of jaundice. Now, you see in Junior, he's got white, colorless, not white, colorless region here, which is the aqueous layer in your body. And then at the bottom, this yellow, where the Billy Rubin's collecting, is his fat layer. So the Billy Rubin collects in fats, collects in fats in your eyes, collects in fat around nerve tissue. Now, the reason his fat is denser than his aqueous layer is because this is dissolved in uh, dichloromethane. Sorry, <laughs> that one went straight out of my head. Dichloromethane, right? Now, Junior needs this Billy Rubin removed from his fat layer because it's going to kill him. And the way we're going to do that is by irradiating him. If you get jaundice, if you uh, have a child with jaundice, and it's not bad, it's male jaundice, what they'll say is, go home, open all the curtains, draw all the curtains back, if it's, so, if it's summer, open the windows, take your clothes off, and walk around so you get as much sunshine as you can. I've been using that excuse for years. <laughs> so, you need sunlight on the Billy Rubin. And what it does is it flicks the shape of the molecule from fat soluble to water soluble. Now it doesn't happen as quick as this, so this is really an illustration. I've made the aqueous layer a little bit out of line to speed things up. So we've taken Junior, we've given some light. Doesn't look as if he's cured. What he needs is that tender love and care that only a parent or a midwife or a doctor can give, i.e. a damn good shit! No, actually, you're not allowed to do this to premature babies. <laughs> I did get asked if you did at the end of the lecture. Now, why has he got to have a damn good shake? He's got to have a damn good shake because he can't mix his oils, his fat layer and his water layer very effectively. You can, I can. So what should happen now, and you can see it in his hands already, where the Billy Rubin was in the fat, it's moving up into the aqueous layer. It's actually collecting in the interface here. See his feet are getting clean? His little hands getting clean here? His feet are getting nice and clean now. The Billy Rubin is moving into the aqueous layer. And if you have something that's toxic in your aqueous layer, there's a very effective way of getting rid of it. And that is the cure for Junior. And that's the cure for jaundice. Right, so now I think we're going to move on to um, energy. Would that be about right, Mike? Okay, so we're going to have some slides. We're going to look at this other great problem in, um, for mankind, clean energy. So I'll knock these down a little bit. Right, so this is an old graph, but it shows how we use different energies from the start of our industrial revolution up to 2000. So we used to use wood, which was in principle renewable, but not at the rate we were using it. Then coal, fertile, natural gas. Coal, oil, and gas are not renewable. Right? When we fill in them, they are gone. And you're not going to get them back. Next slide, please, Mike. This is a, pre a prediction of fossil fuel productions and uses. Now, all predictions are flawed. Every time I look at a prediction, when it predicted something was going to happen in 10 years, when then 10 years come, it doesn't happen. That's not the point. The point is that it is definitely going to run out sometime. We'll find new sources of oil under the Arctic. 
we'll find them in Antarctica. But eventually it will run out. And there's an even bigger problem now with coal, oil and gas. When I started this lecture, the main problem was it was going to run out. When I started lecturing this lecture, which was quite some time ago, the main problem was it was going to run out. Now, the problem is we are going to run out of atmosphere before we run out of fossil fuels. Because if we burn all of them, there will be so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that there will almost certainly be serious climatic changes with all of the uncertainty for mankind that that implies. So the question is, can we get an alternative like energy source? Next one, please, Mike. Right, well, if we look at the Earth from space, we see a planet bathed in sunlight with enough energy to power everything anybody can imagine mankind would need. It's irradiated from this nuclear reactor at 93 million miles away. Next one, please, Mike. Solar energy. You can see, I just point out, March 1984. People have been working on this, scientists have been working on this for years and years. Chemists have been working on this. It's going to be your generation that crack this. So it's, that, that's the, the challenge I'm setting you. Really. If you're interested in science, think of some big challenges like that and see if you can make a contribution to it. But it is your generation who are going to solve the world's energy problems and the world's environmental problems. Next one, please, mate. So, can you get light energy from the sun? Yes, you can. This is my back garden. Plants do it, right? So plants convert sunlight into sugars and chemicals that they use to grow. Next one, please, Mike. That's the basic idea behind it. The plant takes sunlight. The two most boring ingredients in your chemistry set when you're a kid, carbon dioxide and water, the content of a fizzy water bottle and it converts them into oxygen and glucose. It's absolutely fantastic what plants do. Uh, next one, please, Mike. I think that's it, probably, isn't it, for those? So we're going to look at some different uses of, of energy, different generations of energy. So the first one is, can we convert light energy into useful energy, generally? So we're going to have a look at that with our skeletrics. <coughs> so, Talking about the conversion of energies. Skeletrics car, photovoltaic cell. I shine light energy onto the cell, the cell converts the light energy into electrical energy. The electrical energy goes into the engine in the car, the electric motor in the car. It converts the electrical energy into mechanical energy. Will it work? Yes. Mike had forgot to put some on the end. He did. <laughs> right. So we can get energy like that. We can, when we go into space, we can use solar energy set off our Mars rovers. We can make this one go off the end of the bench as well. There. Another dead one. So, we can generate electrical energy and use that mechanical energy. The problem with that car, apart from falling off the end of the cliff, if you're in it, and you go into a tunnel, you're stuck. <laughs> so what are you going to do? You're going to convert that uh, sunlight into, into electrical energy and batteries. But batteries are expensive and heavy for the amount of energy they store. Loads of work on batteries. Electric cars, battery power electric cars, are going to be something of the future. But there are other ways of doing it. One way to do it is to convert the light energy into a chemical fuel. So we can convert, so the question is, can we convert light energy into electrical energy and then into hydrogen and oxygen? Because hydrogen is a fantastic fuel. When you burn hydrogen, you just get water. It has problems because it's gas and you have to compress it or cool it or something, whatever you're going to do. But those problems can't be overcome. People have made hydrogen powered bikes, hydrogen powered cars. Let's say in, in, in practice. So here's a little reactor. The reactor is some uh, water with a tiny little bit of sulfuric acid to allow it to conduct, and two platinum electrodes. And here's a photocell, the, the photovoltaic cell. So I'm going to radiate this with the light from the projector. The projector light's going to be converted into electric energy here. It's going to go down the wires, 
and then where it meets the platinum, where the platinum water interface is, there will be a chemical reaction and the electrical energy will be converted into chemical energy because water will be split. How will we know that it works? Because we'll see bubbles. So that's the conversion of light energy into a chemical fuel. And you can keep that chemical fuel, that hydrogen, you can store it and then use it as and when you want. So light energy into a chemical fuel. And now, just before the last demonstration, I'm going to come back to my camera. People in the front might see it's gone pinky where the rest of it's green, where the camera was. I'm going to put it into develop into this development tank. It's going to take a little while. We we'll look at that right at the end of the lecture, I think. We'll just keep an eye on that. Right. So the last demonstration is the power of hydrogen and oxygen. And what we've got is a little hydrogen oxygen powered rocket. When I was a kid, the great adventure for mankind was to go to the moon. And we're going to the Apollo rockets. We're going to sort of mimic that with our own Apollo rocket made rather cheaply from a pop bottle and the hydrogen and oxygen from 10 drops of water. So we've taken 10 drops of water. Gee, this isn't quite the last demonstration. I'm going to talk about two things when this is gone off. Uh, we've taken 10 drops of water and we've broken it up with hydrogen and oxygen. And we are going to ignite it with a spark from the Tesla coil. Which I have to plug in. And one of the things that you saw on these television programs of these fantastic rockets was enormous slabs of ice falling off from the rockets because the hydrogen and oxygen were liquefied and they were cooled so that the ice built up on the outside. So I'm going to demonstrate that. I'm going to actually, how's my camera coming on? Is my camera coming on? Yes. Is it? It is right. I'm going to do camera because this is the nice one. Then. We'll just keep the music going for a minute and make it. I'm going to show you this hydrogen car as well. So here is an image of a camera in copper. So what we've got now is where the plastic was hit by light has been destroyed by the alkaline solution in the tank. That's exactly what they do on a silicon chip, but this won't be copper, it'll be silicon, and then they'll put something else. Some of that chemical will diffuse into the surface to make up the structures that they want. So that's a silicon, that's a foot resist. I was talking about generating hydrogen. When you get your hydrogen, you can do two things with it. You can burn it conventionally in uh, in a, a combustion engine where you can burn it in a fuel cell and a fuel cell allows you 40% extra efficiency a fuel cell is just an electrical device which takes hydrogen and oxygen and burns it I should have switched this on a while ago so it's not going to be as good as I want but at the back are two little reservoirs one reservoir has got hydrogen gas in it one reservoir has got oxygen in it the water just keeps them um, under control then they flow into this blue block, which is a fuel cell, and that fuel cell allows those two to combine and generates electricity in the process. The reverse of that reaction. Let me see if this will work. It may or may not. I should have started it earlier, but we shall see. It might just work a little bit, just to illustrate the point. There you go. So that's a, a little fuel cell running a car. It didn't last for very long because I forgot to switch it on. But that's the energy from Hydrogen and oxygen being burnt in a fuel cell. Right. Last demonstration. The rocket. Come with the music and mic. I'm going to knock the lights down. The other thing that I did was play this fantastic bit of Strauss whenever, whenever it was going to be rockets. 
the way film would play it. It was always the music that came with the Apollo launch. So the rocket is here. The moon isn't very far away today. It's just across where that pole is. I'm not sure if you're going to reach across that pole. I'm going to count one, two, three, spark this, and fire the rocket. People in the front, fingers in the ears, does make a bang. It's only a little one. We used to do two meter rockets for it. used to make too big a bang. 500 mil rocket, right. One, two, three, launch. Thank you very much. demonstration here. The person who invented one of the first batteries, a man called Grove. And he also saw that his batteries could be turned around to produce power in the, in the cell. Grove was a lawyer and a Swansea man. And he had the first demonstration in 1846 of a powered motorboat our rowing boat on Pentagon Lake in Swansea. Unfortunately, he decided to um, go into the law and became a very undistinguished judge. Eventually, he gave up law for his health and went back to chemistry. And thank goodness he did. Chemistry, engineering, that's the way forward. As I've said before, we've heard a lot about creativity. This is where we're going to see the great discoveries. The discoveries, remember, are always made in the laboratory. And often they're made, you're looking for something, and you find something else. That's the great thing about discoveries. Politicians, civil servants, boards of directors, television commentators, journalists, never made a discovery in their lives. Discoveries are made in the lab. So if you take that message away with you today, I'm sure our lecture will be absolutely better. Thank you very much. It's been wonderful. Thank you.